I'm Helena Roth, and I'm starting a new podcast series, but it'll still go under the name of Tankisbya with Helena Roth. And I'll be having conversations with a handful of friends, one-on-ones, friends that I've gotten to know from, from various places. And I don't really know what this will be, but my friends are interesting people. So I'm guessing we'll have some interesting conversations. Possibly these conversations will be posted, you know, in their totality. Possibly they'll be posted as snippets if there's something interesting and then something really dull. I don't know. We'll have to see. Maybe it will be both. In my first conversation, pal, is Beverly, who is American, a lady that I've gotten to know through Akimbo workshops. We took the creatives workshop together in the spring of 2020. And when that workshop ended, we met up again in a creative community that we're a part of. And Beverly had me on as a guest for her pod, which is called Here's a Quarter. And as we were having that conversation, I realized I wanted to speak more with her. So I asked her if she wanted to be one of my pot conversation partners. And she said yes. So we have just had our first conversation talking about writing, journaling, blogging, talking about reflection, and then somehow veering into learning and teaching and what Beverly does as a teacher. And it's a lovely way to get to know somebody a little bit more. Yeah. So, we'll see. I don't know what this will be. I don't know what what it turns into. But I'm hoping you're along for the ride. See ya. We're all set. Awesome. (laughs) It's like, pew. Pew. (laughs) Tech stuff. Tech stuff. It's not necessarily easy stuff, is it? No. And it's one of those conveniences that seems to sit on your shoulder and chirp until you need it to do something. and, And then it's like stealing your shoes and... Tripping you down the hall. Yep, most definitely. I've been having calendar issues with devices not syncing and for (gasps) the better part of a year and a half. And then it's like I've hobbled along, I've managed, but now it's just, now I have no clue what's in any of the, you know, it's the one calendar, but it exists in different form. It's like I live in like each device lives in its own parallel universe (laughs) oh my god that's awful (laughs) so it's like oh my um so i don't really know i would always be in the wrong place yeah i'm I'm actually yes i'm actually starting to be a little bit in the wrong place and, and kind of double booking myself in ways that i don't usually do so i need to get this sorted so but the good thing is now it's so bad that I actually need to get it sorted. You know, before it was, well, I could hobble along. But now mm, it's, it's, uh, it's too long gone. Yeah, I use a product called BusyCal, which syncs up with multiple other services. It is a Mac product. Um, and I think the company's name is just BusyMac. It, uh, I've used it for 
a while, and it will take input from Google, from Apple, from Outlook. So it syncs. That works for me. I'm going to check that out. You just never know. Because um, right now, it's, right now, nothing is working. So. Oh, that's, that's such a bad feeling. Yeah, and it's, you know, I have a, a, ma- a bigger issue. The, there's something on my Mac that's called a keychain that mm-hmm. I think is the thing that remembers passwords, where you yeah. are and passwords and stuff. And it's not working. The main the main keychain kind of disappeared somehow in around Christmas. So whenever I have to reboot my computer, I have to enter in all of those oh my keywords gosh. or passwords again. That and this is like linked. Two identities. Yeah, and I haven't. I haven't. Mm. It's it's like it's there's something weird, and and then I know you know I'm sure there are computer savvy people around who can fix this, but then I have to be without my computer. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, that, oh, um, no. oh, that, that, that's rough. Sorry. <laughs> Well, it's like because I mean, one thing the Mac is great at is is making sure that you can't remember any of your passwords because it suggests things that are an arm long. Yeah, yeah, it, you know, it's like so. There's, but I have to fix this. Enough is enough, kind of. Um, but you know, I'll work it out somehow. Um, you know what, Beverly? What? This is the first conversation I have with anybody in this um, new pod uh, idea of mine. That is so cool. I feel honored. Yeah, you should feel. But it might be a bit scary, too, because I have no clue what this is supposed to be. Well, then we will just have to (laughs) jump together. (laughs) I think we will. I mean, I guess that's, I guess I'm not telling the whole truth when I say that. I have this idea of of meandering conversations. You know I love meandering conversations. The Tankespian monthly Zoom calls, meandering conversations, right? You just never really know where you're going to go and how many twists and turns it's going to be until you get to where you didn't know you were going to come, you know? Um, it's very Alice in Wonderland. It is very Alice in Wonderland, right? And and I kind of like, you know, I like that. I don't kind of like that. I really like that. And still, it's like, so that's one of the thoughts. But, with you know, there might... I, I, I also want to just have conversations where we are having a conversation, you and me, not sort of selling something to listeners or, um, you know, speaking with the listener in mind, in a sense, but rather perhaps more inviting the listener in to just be a part of of the conversation. Um, Yeah. Kind of like when you were a kid and listening to your parents talk. Yeah. I love doing that. Yeah, me too. (laughs) I was, that was the original fly on the wall in my family. I haven't I haven't made that connection, but I always love that. I loved I could lie under the table, um, under the dining room table and just listen to the adults. Hmm. Maybe that's where I've gotten a little bit of this love for meandering conversations. Uh, that's a nice thought. Mm. 
that actually goes back for me all the way to being five or six years old. It's probably summer. My mom would be sitting at the kitchen table with her best friend, Sharon, and they'd be drinking iced coffee. And I, that's what, I used to swipe my mother's iced coffee when I was a little cure. So I never had to learn to like coffee. You know, and they'd just be talking lady stuff. And they, I was the oldest child, so I got to be around adults more because there wasn't anyone else there yet. So it's, it's a very peaceful memory, you know, just mm. light. Mm. How, how much, how common do you think that is today? I don't know. Um, partly, I had the advantage of growing up with a mom who did not work outside the home when I was very small. So, I mean, back then, it, women didn't often work outside the home. So kids, you know, kids got to run around with knowing that there was always an attentive adult, plus there, we did not have these things. The we were not distracted by video games or much TV. We, we, when I was, I was probably seven or eight before we got a TV, and then it was a black and white. It was just not as appealing as you know what we have now. That you know, it's this big, <laughs> and. And it goes back to that idea of technology. We, technology only served us part of the time, and we did not serve it back when I was growing up. We, we were out the door, you know. I'd spent all of my time either running around outside with friends or brothers and sisters or reading a book. Did the time. Technology was the dial telephone and the washing machine. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's that's one of the things that I think is, is kind of, it's so easy to think that technology needs to be something that runs on electricity or Wi-Fi or, you know, it has a cord or batteries. But, you know, technology is, a pencil is a technology. It's just technology that's been around for a really, really, really long time. You know, so, so, but, I, yeah, I, I wonder about that because I wonder if not quite a lot of those types of conversations that you can reminisce about your mom and her best friend were, you know, perhaps they still exist, but many of them probably take place over the phone or Zoom. There, well, especially the past year, it, um, there, there was a, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversation was was not common. I think we, we're going to have to relearn some of that. Um, the you know, I have a really good friend that I I talk to every day. And in this past year, I've, I've probably seen him face to, well, face to mask in person fewer than 10 times. You know, Did you we, used to meet up regularly? We, more yeah, often? yeah, we would go out and have a, have a meal together. Um, we and we talk every night on the phone, so that and boy, our conversations can wander. He's <laughs> he's really interesting person, very artistic. Um, probably has an eidetic memory because he remembers stuff. It's like, how did you come up with that? <laughs> 
Uh, and he, you know, he, he's kind of like me. He'll connect stuff, and I'm usually three or four jumps behind him. <laughs> mm. So I think there's two kinds of conversation that I've been missing over the last year. There's the just daily, the, the little things that kind of underwrite a social environment. Hey, how you doing? Man, that traffic was hideous. Did you get stuck? You know, oh, those, that's a, you know, those are pretty shoes. Just that, that little social grease. Mm. And then there's the ones where you're really diving into something that is interesting or difficult or at many angled, kind of like the Tankispjorn ones, but it's one-on-one. And so I think there, there are definitely two sides that I'm more aware of now that COVID has placed us away from each other. Yeah, and I was listening the other day. I do not remember which. It was probably a podcast. It usually is. Somebody was speaking about, or maybe I read it. Well, whatever. How, like, Zoom conversations or, or connection over Zoom wasn't, wasn't real. You know, not as real as meeting in 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 the flesh, and and it's like I don't know that that is true, and I think it it kind of diminishes what has been possible for many many centuries, which is you can have dear close friends that you do not see perhaps have never seen but you write to them you know that's what you did before and now you can zoom with them or you can chat online or stuff but it's as if we've you know it's like because we have zoom now and everybody does it it's like well then that's not real you know, it, it's very real, <laughs> it's, right? It's, it's very yeah, real. It's real. Oh, I think it can be an incredible blessing. You know, I haven't seen my 80, 83-year-old mother in a year. And, you know, on Zoom, on Zoom I can see this because little old people, they lean over their computers so you only so see the top see of their head. <laughs> <laughs> but... And so, the, the, you know, it, in some ways it is a substitute. It is a, I wouldn't say it's not real. It is different. And yeah. Seth Godin sent out a blog post the other day talking about trying to make Zoom more human by using he said, oh, it's cheap and it's really easy. And then he shows this setup that is like a mirror and ring lights. And like, okay, Seth. <laughs> it won't cost you more than a thousand bucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah kind of no. <laughs> yeah, I read that one too. <laughs> it, it, you do lose some of the nonverbal communication, which drives me absolutely crazy because I teach communications and they're meant to be communications in person. So having where I'm losing half of my data it drives me nuts. But your mention of letters brings up another idea for me, those ep- epistolary conversations. Mm-hmm. There's something really What alluring. does that mean? Ep- epistolary means written uh, in letters. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, I think I got the term from 
uh, I don't remember what book it was. It's called an epistolary novel where it's written entirely in letters. Mm, back and forth. The modern version is like tweets and Facebook posts. <laughs> <laughs> when you write a letter to someone, you are conversing with them, but in an uninterrupted way. So you can put the entire thought down and then wait for a response. It, it, it uses a different kind of patience and social cue so that you have to get your cues from the way it's written and the word choice and maybe even the handwriting. Yeah, and there's a different pace to that, at least letters, letters. Um. Mm. Yeah, and you can go back and read it. It doesn't change. No. Mm. Yeah, there's there and and I think that's perhaps, in a sense, the different pace to that. That's perhaps a little bit what I get when I blog, you know, when I write. Mm -hmm. That sense of putting out a piece of the conversation and then being patient about return, yeah. That and, yeah, and also in the actual writing, as I am writing it, it's like I'm having this inner dialogue with myself and then some of it kind of sticks on the page. Some of it, you know, flies away um, and, and, and escapes or doesn't get caught or gets culled, uh, you know, but it is kind of a little bit like letters. I've... I've I've used my blogs, my blog posts a little bit like that. I can go back in time. I've blogged since like um, August of 2012. Wow. Um, so I have like two and a half thousand blog posts or something in my, in my luggage, so to speak. And I can go back and use it kind of like letters, you know, from me in the past, I can see where was I, who was I, what was I thinking, what was important for me, what did I believe, has that changed, is there a, you know, if I read it now, do I recognize myself still in it, or have I shifted away from that, whatever position it was, uh, quite interesting to and and there's a few when I was doing the audiobook of doing gentle with an edge when I was reading it there's one of those um doing gentle posts that I wrote and put out into the world uh just as a couple of months after me and my then husband had separated Oh. So reading that post now was like, oh, I can, you know, it's like it warms my heart for me, for the me that I was uh, back in 2016. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's so, how I use yeah, go ahead. And you. That's how I use my journals. I've kept a journal since I was 12. So that's, they started out on paper, and then eventually I did go to a computer file. And going back and reading some of those, it's like, who was that? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Do you still do, do that? I, yeah, I go back through occasionally. I've... Um, I've started 
there was, I had one computer file that was literally five years of journaling. It's like, well, this is too much. You've got to break these up. So, and if the file gets corrupted, you're like, eh. mm -hmm. um, So I've started doing just one year per file, and that's helpful. I still like the writing things out by hand, though. There's something different mm -hmm. about that. And I'm, I'm the blank book queen. I have dozens of them. So that's another way to make your thoughts visible. So what do you write in your journal? Because this is the thing. I've never been able to journal or write a diary or whatever you want to call it. it it's just, you know, I have, I got a diary when I was, I don't know how many years old. And, you know, whenever I would clean my room, which was like once every year or every other, you know, two times a year, I would find it and I would write something. And it, you know, then inevitably starts with, Hello, dear diary. I'm cleaning my room again. <laughs> <laughs> and come across you and it's like, okay, this is where I'm at. You know, so I've never been able to get into that habit. But but my blogging, that is the act of publishing it, cost me cost me to to do it. So I, you know, it's like I wanted to write. I didn't write. Okay, I'll start a blog. I still didn't write. Okay, I started a challenge to write every day for a hundred days. Then I got into it. Um, yeah, I, the way, I mean, I don't, I think I started keeping a journal because I was, a girl going into adolescence and I had all this stuff up in my head. I'd, I'd always done some writing, little stories and poems. And um, We moved around a lot when I was a kid, so I had a lot of things to process. And for me, it's a way to process thoughts and feelings and to say, at least to myself, things I felt like I couldn't say elsewhere and I use it now as there's some of that that I tend not to put in stuff that's happening in the broader world like the news unless it's something that really penetrates to me um it's relationships, it's thoughts, it's what I'm trying to do. It's a personal pep talk. <laughs> and so it's like, here's here's what I'm trying to do. Here's how I'm going to try to do it. Here's my list. I, I, every once in a while when I really want to get stuff done, it's like, okay, here's my list. So do you have a routine? Is it like, well, I start every day journaling or I finish every day journaling? Or is it like, well, whenever? My usual time is in the morning, um, fairly early. I'll start a post and... Um, <laughs> Excuse me. Dog's behind me. It, they, I often get interrupted by critters. And sometimes I'll I'll come I'll come back to the computer at the end of the day and realize the file's still open and I'll look at it and go and and literally the post is well it's Tuesday morning seven fifteen my coffee tastes really good today I know I have four things I need to do I'm feeling and then nothing No. So the it's not not super formal. I mean, I don't you know some people have journals that they could publish and they would be amazing, mm. but that's not yours. You're saying. 
It, yeah, a lot of it is just, you know, it's what I did during the day. Um, so there's a rhythm to the days. I suppose if I went back and was like, oh, every Tuesday I'm in a bad mood. Maybe. <laughs> so it's something you could look back through for patterns. I'm not sure the majority of it is any kind of literature. It's just... Um, what did they call them? Day books. In a, the um, many people back early last century, because they were keeping track of what the the weather was for farming, they they would note down that it was, you know, frost this morning, but warmed up this afternoon. We planted the potatoes, and the cow is about ready to drop her calf. It, yeah. But so did you learn how to journal from someone? Or did you, f I mean, did your mom journal? Did your any of the other adults nope. around you journal? No, nope. I just did it. I, I'd always been a bookish kid. And mm. they, my somebody for my 12th birthday gave me one of those little locking diaries. And it's like, ooh, paper. Mm. <laughs> so I that's where I started. And you know, that that one is full of things like sibling rivalry. And my, I have a sister who's just 14 months younger, so we're pseudo twins. Yeah, pseudo twins. And mm. On top of that, she's she, she was born much feistier, more outgoing than I am. So she kind of liked to to torment me. <laughs> it's the younger sibling, you know, take my stuff, ruin it, all that kind of thing. You know, childhood. But we're we're close now. But, so yeah. do you have like, you know? Meter after meter of, of old diaries and journals? I have uh, probably about six paper books. I mean, it took a while to fill some of these. And I have a bunch of <clears throat> files on the computer. Mm. And I have a few scattered books that I've used for kind of random notes. I used to keep a car journal. I would go get a coffee and sit in the car and and usually process stuff that was emotionally difficult, a, a breakup, stress at work, that kind of thing. Yeah, I wonder how many people do this. I think it's it is processing. Yeah. For me, I have ones, but like cuz you can't have too many papers. Um I have one journal that I take with me when I travel and it's I absolutely love it cuz it's a leatherette bright red cover. It's made in Italy. The paper's really thin and really beautiful. And I took it with me two summers ago. I spent time at what's called a getaway. These little shipping container cabins that are just perfect. They, um, it's in, in the woods in northern Ohio. And they have a sleeping platform, a heat and air, a little tiny bathroom, and a kitchenette with Two burners and and a little half fridge and a and some uh, cooking implements. I was really impressed because they had good knives. I'm like, oh, <laughs> cooking. And I was reading one of Brene Brown's books at the time by audio books. So I wasn't carrying another thing, and I started to process some. <clears throat> 
things I had remembered from childhood that I was still dragging with me. And it, I took one really long walk and I actually got lost all by myself in these woods I didn't know. It took me about three hours to come back, but I was thinking through all that stuff as I got back to the cabin and I wrote all this down and page after page and it was so cathartic and healing to finally have that out of my head. You know, it had been rattling around in the back of a closet somewhere, occasionally sending off flares. And since I was able to write it down, I could let it go. It was amazing. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's one of the, the, the beauties to this. I was listening to a beginner's guide to dream journaling or dream recording or something by Clarissa Pinkola Estes uh, as an audiobook. It's just like an hour, 20 minutes or something. I listened to it last week and thought, oh man, so I, I've already listened to it once more. She says that about dreams, about... Mm. It's 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 beaut it's a beautiful little audiobook. Um and I will listen to it more times. Uh I've already, you know, kind of started in on the third time. She says dreams are are messages from home, which I think huh. is so beautiful. And you don't have to, you know, record or keep a record of every dream, you know, as long as it's, it's, as long as there's a message from home, it will come again. So, you know, if you lose a dream, it's not gone. You know, if it's relevant, it will come back again. But she says, sometimes people, if they have like scary dreams, if they write them down and then read this loud or tell it to someone the dream maker she calls it the dream maker will hear that you've understood the message and it will go away huh. and i just thought oh man you know it's the processing you need to do the processing of it you need to sort of what was it what is this to me what parts of these dreams do I remember and what's the meaning I put on that? Which parts wasn't so important? And, you know, it's like, and if I then can share that, and, and she specifically says out loud so that a dream maker will hear that you have grasped the message and can then send another message from home. Um, and I think, I mean, I do... My blogging probably serves a lot of the same uh, purpose as, as your journaling. Um, I'm sure that there are song makers or painters or photographers who kind of get the same type of processing work done through however they put it out into the world. Um, but I think it's important to have some outlet, right? Some way of, of getting that processing. Somewhere to process, somehow to process, to, to like kind of, like you say, get it out of your system in a way. It certainly was for me. I, maybe there are some folks who are, not built to enjoy reflection and just don't derive <clears throat> the same benefit. But I maybe as a you know as a facet of how I create, how I make my living, that to me a human being wants to make meaning. And if you're going to try to make meaning, that usually comes with thinking about 
what it means. Do you think that meaning making is a part of the uh, pattern recognition aspect that seems to be also a very human trait? You know, we're like pattern pattern seeking creatures. Um, yeah, it, that that goes. <laughs> okay, now you get the biology geek. Um, <laughs> pattern recognition is important all the way from predator prey relationships you know when when a fly crosses a frog's field of view it's a pattern that they recognize and mm. they can go after throw it. out their tongue <laughs> yeah <clears throat> but we <clears throat> excuse me pattern i I'm, I'm completely driven by pattern that it's I'm always pattern seeking it's part of how I see things it's why I like photography it's why I'm a birder because I look for pattern so pattern because it's predictable it's a way that we can take in what's happening and make a prediction for what happens next so it's protective to be able to recognize patterns because we can bounce that little way into the future. And it has to be energy efficient as well, right? Recognizing the pattern is, is a way of, of building in a, 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 a loop, a, a kind of a, you know, it's like a shorter path to, right? Instead of reading every letter, you know, the brain has the word as an image. So yeah, it's it's yeah. energy efficient, right? Yeah, so you're not just recognizing yellow bug flying upward on blue flower. It's oh, cabbage white, that's food. I eat it. Mm. Well, not me, but <laughs> if you are a frog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that I mean and that's why um in biology, so yeah, pattern recognition is the the whole pattern. If you look at monarch butterflies and viceroys, monarchs have substances in their bodies that most predators don't like. So if it looks like a monarch, which is very brightly patterned, it's not camouflaged at all, the, the bird says, okay, well, I'm not eating that. And the viceroy butterfly looks a lot like a monarch and it's mimicry because it sees the viceroy and thinks I'm probably not going to like that either so it's it's a case of similarity standing in which is like you know I can go down a total rabbit hole here imagine how somehow the the pre and the ancestor of the viceroy butterfly would like look and see that hey those guys over there the monarchs they're not getting snatched up by birds as fast as we are we had better you know unconsciously uh, like it's it's fascinating yeah, and I don't know how long that it takes to develop those. Those are evolutionary patterns, which, you know, they can they take hundreds of years, if not millennia. Insects, um, because they're prey animals, they probably, if their coloring is not advantageous, they will get eaten well before they breed. So the, yeah. the more advantageous color forms... Yeah. Definitely breed quicker, which is what happened in. I think I, I think this was taught in in a history class in Swedish schools when I was, you know, ten, twelve, fifteen, something. How in during the Industrial Revolution in England, when the coal 
you know, was starting to be used so much that those moths that used to be on birch, they were white because then they sort of, you know, were, and then as because of the coal, the birch all of a sudden turned grayer and grayer and darker and darker. And then being a white moth, really bad idea. Everybody can see you then, <laughs> right? So in, in a very short time, um, all of those moths were like dark gray, blackish. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. Of course, that must be also then, well, one, because they have a short sort of breed cycle. You know, they don't yeah. carry their babies for nine months in the belly and, and you know, but but also because they're prey, so the the white ones were snatched up. Yeah, so you can ima- <clears throat> you can imagine that a moth lays hundreds of eggs and maybe forty of them go get through the caterpillar stage and get to be moths again. And out of those, there's a gradation, and the very palest ones don't, don't can't hide, and they get snatched. And the very darkest ones are better able to hide, and more of them breed than the pale ones. So then the next generation, there's more darker moths than there are lighter ones. And the, so the dark trait, the yeah. wink for wing color, becomes selected for. Mm. and moth generations are every year it doesn't take 20 years no Hmm. but so what because you know you so is it is it the pattern recognizing that is is one of the things that's made you such a skilled birder as you say and you know fauna and you know butterflies and you know all kinds of weird critters and i know that it's because we're in a creative community together and you can spot birds and flowers and i don't know everything Um, it so because pattern and in literally my first full sentence was what's that <laughs> driving force of my life what is that <laughs> so I have an entire library of field guides plus I have four bird guides on my phone and a plant guide wow. so it that's part of what allows me to keep my mind active is learning new stuff. I, Because I'm a photographer, I don't like having stuff in the frame that I can't identify. You know, I, I don't want to be out shooting pictures and go, oh, look, pink flower. It's like, no, it's a pink lesser lady slipper. And I've not mm. ever been lucky enough to photograph them, but... <laughs> But if you did, you'd recognize them, right? <laughs> yeah. So it, it just makes a difference to me. I, I did this um, last summer, I think in either it was the creatives community or in um, the community we have now, where I was out walking and all, it was in TCW. And every day when I would go out walking, I would find some new flower and I'd identify it. And I discovered through that, how many of the local wildflowers here are actually uh, exotics? They're, they were not plants that are native to this area. They were brought in is because um, a lot of the places along the road that I live on was an old farmstead. So it, it had plants brought in from elsewhere and... They've naturalized. So, so the, elsewhere the, in the U.S. or elsewhere from other places in the world? Other places in the world. One of the patches I'm watching right now is, is called Star of Bethlehem. 
and it's actually from Europe or, or Africa. So we, we have invasives. Some of them are invasive. Some of them are just exotic. The, and the difference um, is just how prolific they are? And how much of a pest they can be. So garlic mustard, is the stuff is horrible. It's it's our version of kudzu. It oh, it grows it's everywhere. Lovely, it's kind of... It's yummy. It, it, um, it sounds yummy, but I don't think the plant is used for that. But garlic mustard, isn't that, um, in Swedish we call them, um, they're the ones who look like lily in the valley, but isn't? No. Okay. That's not what, that's not the one okay. that we call garlic mustard. It, okay. It, it is actually kind of pretty. They, they have fat heart-shaped leaves and a little spray of white flowers at the top. I know but that But they one. are invasive. Oh, yeah. But you can eat those, too. I I do. Think, yeah, I think you can. Yeah, I do. I have. They're not invasive here, I think. They just are here. Yeah, so we have a number of plants that have been brought in from elsewhere because the normal checks and balances on growth are not here. They They take off and push out other undergrowth species. Mm. And partly that's because we have a really bad habit of mowing things. Mm. When you disturb a roadside repeatedly, what comes back are the plants that can take a lot of disturbance, which are often the exotics. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. What? No, I was thinking about you said earlier that you don't know that everybody benefits from reflection. Do you think that's true, or do you think it's just that some people haven't learned how to? I, it may be that they haven't learned how. Um, maybe. They have a really strong resistance to it for some reason. Um, things like not quite remembered trauma, I think, can, you can go down two paths. One is to just simply cut that off and, mm -hmm. and wall it up and not go there. And the other is to, you know, gird up and go there and finally clean out what it is that you're holding back from that. And sometimes those are two parts of the same life. Uh, um, uh, I mean, even in the absence of trauma, I have known people who would rather live right in the here and now. It's like, I don't want to get into all that stuff. I'm going to do my job during the day. I'm going to enjoy my family at night. And <clears throat> I'm not going to worry too much about what's up in the attic. And would something good come out of doing that? Maybe. I I think it's something you have to walk into willingly or mm. it, it will be more painful than it has to. Yeah, and I think you're right in, in saying this, that, I mean, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I meditate and, and you know, sit in silence and whatnot and, and practice, you know, breathing techniques and stuff. But sure, if you have... 
if you have trauma in you, you know, it's like, well, be cautious or, you know, seek professional help. You might need somebody to help guide you because that journey can be a lot deeper and darker than you kind of think from the surface. But but at the same time, I was listening to my friend Charlotte. You know Charlotte. Um, she had an episode in Swedish on her pod where she was talking to somebody who um, was writing about, at least, uh, disassociation. Like when the trauma that you experience is so severe that the only way the human body can precisely survive it is by actually just stepping away from that. And and if you are, and usually it happens when you're, you know, in your childhood or it, it that's at least what I heard them saying that, you know, Trauma in childhood, repeatedly especially, could do that. And I think it was her or somebody else who said that, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable, rational, and on point response to the situation. Right? But if it's done so much that you then disassociate, you know, 20 years later, if something that reminds you of that, then it's no longer on point. You know, then it is um, like a pattern, right? It's a pattern that you've learned, but it's not a pattern that serves you anymore because the situation that triggers the disassociation might not at all be one that warrants that type of reaction. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, could, it may just be an association, you know, somebody was involved, you know, you have a traumatic association with someone who wore red boots. Yeah, so yeah. there's somebody walking down the street wearing red boots 30 years later and all of a sudden you're you were there. Yeah. Sweaty and Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting what what kind of can be hidden in hidden inside people. Uh. Yeah, and they don't always know. I, mean, I one of the friends that I've met in akimbo workshops right now is a woman who's she had a really rich life and has really been very active in trying to promote a better world and she was she's written she recently wrote a, a nonfiction book and it she was saying you know I have this other idea I want to write a fictionalized version of my father's childhood but I don't think I can write fiction and then she's pouring out this stuff. I'm like, oh my god! It's good. It's am- it's amazing, and I I don't particularly like historical fiction. This is this is not like the way back. This is like nineteen thirties, forties, and she's describing. Um. It's her own father's experience of of being orphaned mm-hmm. and actually being the one who was trying to care for his mother as she was, I, I think, from the dying in childbirth. Mm. Like, holy moly. So there's this... Using writing as a lens to show how how suffering can be integrated. 
It, the, the writing is really effective. It's also just almost unbearably sad to think of this, mm. you know, twelve-year-old boy with no adults around, and and four younger brothers. Mm. But I mean, that must be again the the. Uh, the ability of humans to tell stories and then later on to write stories down. You know, it's like it's, it's such a major part of us. It has to be evolutionary advantageous uh, somehow. It, for all of the millennia that we did not have physical iconography stories, the oral tradition was the only way we had to pass on history and culture. And, and then even after we had some versions of physical iconography, that it was painted on a wall. You couldn't take that with you. Mm. So we... I think in part we became storytellers because it gives structure to human groups living together. It, it helps us create society and being able to have larger groups was protective. It allowed us to make labor more efficient to, you know, some people were the farmers, some people were the hunters, other people were taking care of the children or making the clothes. And it. So, and then once you had professions, you had to have a way to pass that on. If, you know, we didn't write textbooks, we learned by doing and telling. Uh, so, yeah, that's one of my pet peeves. This, like, almost insufferable belief that we need school in order to learn. It's like, it is a way. It is a way. It is a system that we set up. But we learn long before we imagine this particular system, you know. Yeah, the, I mean, the universe, the idea of a, you know, sage on the stage kind of thing, that's been around since the Greeks. But it, I mean, being in academia, and all of the fads go through here. It's like lecturing is terrible, TBL is everything. TBL is terrible. You can... You have to do like flip classroom. And TBL, trouble based learning? Team based. Team based learning. Okay. Which is sometimes trouble based. -based. Yes, precisely. <laughs> Team based learning. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it, I probably would have hated it. I, I was not particularly social in, in college. I, it's where students work in groups, in groups. and yeah. solve problems of some kind. Yeah. I go back and forth on it. I, I think it, again, it allows that division of labor to some extent. It also allows some personalities to come to the fore if they're more assertive and act more sure of themselves even when they're wrong. So that can skew the results. The, um, it's supposed to help them with thought processes. I, I'm not yet sure that it always does. The but again, you know, the, the fads in education. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I like audiobooks. I like TED Talks. I don't mind the lecture. 
Mm-hmm. I, and I love lecturing. Now, I'm not the person who stands up there staring at their notes and pontificating. That's not what I mean by a lecture. I'm usually walking around the classroom like a little duck in a shooting gallery. And it's more interactive than just me spouting stuff. It's like, so, you know, I've just told you this and this and this are true. So what would happen if this part didn't work properly? And then, you know, you get some answers. And so it's, it's not, it's not a one-way performance. And I don't think anyone can learn by only listening. You, you have to work with ideas in order to assimilate them. But, I mean, isn't it like with most everything, fads kind of seem to be, you know, here's the solution, and if everybody only did this one thing, everything would be fine? It's like, no, one size still doesn't fit all. Yeah. You know, it never has. It never will. You know, but still it's like, oh, but maybe this one is the one. You know, the magic bullet. The solution to all problems. He's like, no. Yeah. It, it, we're, we're terrible about being faddish, especially when you've, you know, I, I teach in a professional school where they, they have standards that come from outside. And that means that there's always some new mandate. It's like you have to have this much of X facet in your instruction and then we're all scrambling to figure out how to do it. I'm also at a smaller school. We don't have the same kind of resources to bring in instructional designers to say, okay, we're going to help you retool this. We're all doing it ourselves. And so if it looks like it was put together with spit and bailing wire, it's like, well, it was. <laughs> so what do you teach? Um, I teach a pretty broad range of topics. I'm in a biochemistry section of my department so I teach aspects of biochemistry and cell biology for graduate students and medical students I also teach cancer biology and cellular communication how cells talk to one another Um, and for the first time in probably 25 years next week I'm teaching reproductive physiology which goes way back to my training so what are you trained at? (laughs) Comparative endocrine physiologist. Comparative endocrine physiologist. What's a physiologist? Somebody who knows their physiology. Yeah. So, and I was endocrine this, is all of the, the the secretions of the body, right? The, the, the hormones internal, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. hormones. Um, so, anatomy is form. Physiology is function. So physiology is how the body performs its essential functions. And my work was comparative because I did not work on humans. I worked on actually reptiles and amphibians. Which are quite far from human physiology or... Um, In certain aspects. So comparative physiology is usually based around the idea of solving um, functional problems. So the main functional problems for animals are things like um, how do you reproduce and grow new babies? How do you manage ions in water? How do you take in enough nutrients and make sure that they go to the right places? How do you maintain internal temperature and make sure your systems work at that temperature? So those are fundamental problems. And the way on a cellular level those problems are solved are not all that different. The the main differences between human beings on the one hand and reptiles and amphibians on the other are the... um, their particular environment they're adapted to. So amphibians in particular can be aquatic, which we're definitely not. Mm -hmm. And both of those animals 
do not rely on internal mechanisms to maintain body temperature. They work on external means. But a lot of the other stuff is is not massively different. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, other you know, other than the obvious one with mammals that are have are live bearing and feed their young with bodily yeah. production. So th- there's some of those differences. So, but so how do you, I mean, okay, so you teach cancer, what did you say, cancer biology? Yeah, I teach cancer, cancer cell biology. I, it, it all, so how do you know that then? Is it like, do you get a new course and then you have to scram and, and learn it? Or is like, you know these things? It it was an evolution. So endocrinology is an interesting field because it sits right at the border between physiology and cellular biology. Um, mm-hmm. I went so in my training after my my initial graduate degree, I started to learn molecular endocrinology. And once I got into the molecular field, I was looking at some interesting aspects of how cells communicate with one another and how that leads to changes in their individual functions. Yeah, because the cells kind of act like little factories, right? In in a way, um, but each of those factories is tuned to do different things and they Mm -hmm. can dynamically shift what they okay. do. We need more of this now, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. But then about 12 years ago or so, I took a course in teaching that it was a summer thing in, it was even longer ago than that. It was actually 20 years ago. Oh my God. Yeah, and time. one of the things I teach all year now is communication, like so, cell communication, or communication, communication. No communication. I I teach students how to do presentations, how oh. to write, how um, how to do a how to how to you know it's literally how to talk about your work. Hmm. So how long have you been a teacher since you took that course in teaching? Oh, no. I've been a teacher since I was probably since about halfway through my undergraduate years. And, and, um, so you got into teaching kind of directly? It it comes with the territory. Once you um, begin graduate study, in the life sciences, in very often, you're asked to help um, people who teach, particularly lab sections, instruct large groups of students. So I started teaching labs probably in 1980. So it's been, it's been a while. It's been a while, for sure. I was eight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then it, my dad was a teacher and then a school administrator and always was an educator. So I think I, I get that part from him. That is my dog shaking her lead. They do. That. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. It's nice to get to know you a little bit better because there's been so many things that I've been like, I really know so much about this and that, but I don't know like how or why you know much about this or that. I I think it started with my dad was a high school biology teacher when I was really little. So I, when I was really little, I read Dr. Seuss mm. and his high school biology textbook. Mm. 
<laughs> I still we that was back in the days when they did not have a biological supply where you you would get materials for science labs. So he would literally go out. We lived in Michigan and catch bullfrogs to do mm-hmm. demonstrations mm-hmm. for his class. I remember. He took me down in the basement and we're doing his, his dissection mm-hmm. of, of a frog and saying, okay, I was six years old and I was hooked. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a little bit interesting. My mom, um, you know, she, she studied to become a, a, a physician and she started doing that when I was, Seven, eight, something. Um, so I've been, you know, I've been fascinating at reading her textbooks, you know, looking at all of these horrible images of people with deformities and ulcers and eczema and wounds. And, and you know, it's like just, oh, it's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and one time I got home. We lived just a couple of blocks from school. So I was walking home. I walk in, I enter, I open the door, the kitchen door, and on the kitchen is a skull. Because <laughs> she'd gotten to borrow a skeleton from, you know, from, from the university. Um, and I was just, oh, <laughs> that's so interesting. But I remember that skull just going, that's not normally what's on the kitchen table um but it was yeah that that first encounter with the idea that our heads are anatomy that's that is very striking i remember my instance like that i was probably 19 and Mm -hmm. some boy was trying to impress me and he had access to the anatomy labs at, at the med school. <clears throat> so he walks me into this active lab. And sitting on the bench is not just a skull, but a sagittally sectioned half a human head. <laughs> it's like, whoa. <laughs> and I don't know if he expected me to be freaked out. And, yeah. You know, I'd been I'd been looking at anatomy books since I was six. Yeah. But it is, you know, I I still can see that initial view. It, I wasn't freaked out, but it was kind of that is a human part. In the, I mean, it is, it's really interesting, like, oh my gosh, look at all this stuff we don't ever get to see. Yeah. And okay. then it's because our faces, how we recognize each other, there's still that, wait, that was a person, mm. not just a part. Mm. No, precisely. Precisely. Kind of keeping to the humanity of it. Yeah. So, did you end up studying biology after your mom exposed you? I'm a. I'm a. I have a master's in biology. Oh, did you specialize? <laughs> well, no, not really. I I wanted to become a a, a, a physician as well, um, but then my mom kind of kept up a steady stream of don't go into it. You know, yeah, sure, it pays well, but after long, long, hard years of slogging. So in, I think, second year of, of, of like gymnasium, we call it here, as secondary uh, upper school type, I watched a documentary on a Paul Cox, who is an, a Mormon ethnobiologist, ethnobotanist, ethnopharmacologist, active in the Samoan islands. Uh, And I was hooked. So then I wanted to become an ethno, 
uh, pharmacologist. Um, so I studied biology. Um, but then I kind of, you know, how you, you know, you kind of veer off. So I went into the pharmaceutical industry um, and have worked with with uh, project management and validation of equipment and writing standard operating procedures and stuff. So uh, I've not really worked with what I learned as a, as a biologist in a sense. Um, but I still, you know, I find it fascinating. I find it interesting. Uh, yeah, there's a level of organization required for project management. I'm not sure I ever had. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I've let it go. Uh, or rather, it's it's kind of way down or way up in the attic because there's more fun stuff to do, but, but it's there. But one of my favorite classes uh, at university was human physiology. We had a semester of that, and it was just, you know, it is so fascinating. Uh, we also did vertebrate and evertebrate morphology, uh -huh. uh, which was also just amazing. You know, what happens when, you know, egg meets sperm, you know, two cells turn into one, turn into two, turn into four, turn into eight, and then how everything just stems from those eight those eight uh, yeah it's fascinating I remember I I can remember how fascinated I was by that how like awestruck by the fact that we know all of this we know that that one cell will turn into your skin that one cell will turn into all of those endocrine systems that you're working on that cell will turn into the skeleton and stuff you know it's just absolutely fascinating and, and who comes up with this thing? You know, how can nature just, how? You know, it's like, so getting into the really nitty gritty of it, and we know precisely all of this, I'm struck by, the, you know, I'm struck by awe. How is this possible? You know, we know that it works, but how can it work? How can we have gotten to this? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, we know some fairly complex organisms really well. Like the, the little worm called C. elegans. It, it's a little flatworm. And because it has very limited number of parts... There was a geneticist named Sidney Brenner who managed basically to map all of its genetic elements to exact functions and cells. And so if you take away one, it, it just takes away that function. It is very cool. So you can find out what functions rely on other functions to, to work. To work, yeah. Amazing. Awe inspiring. Or awe inducing. Uh, for sure. Yeah. There's always more to learn. Yeah. I think that's where we wrap. There's always more to learn. Isn't that a good place to end it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? The fact that it's never going to end. <laughs> it won't end. That is true. But we can stop <laughs> recording. <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. This has been so much fun. Thank you. Yeah.